Now, our next speaker is uh, one of our, another one of our international speakers. It's uh, Neil Lee from New Zealand. Um, Neil has been a uh, materials technologist attached to the specialist concrete technology group at uh, Opus Research since uh, 2008. He has a particular interest in concrete durability and the condition assessment and remediation of concrete structures. Uh, prior to joining Opus, uh, he held a sim similar position at Brands in New Zealand. And today, Neil's going to talk about uh, New Zealand experiences with reinforced concrete service life prediction models for marine structures. Welcome, Neil. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you today to honour Professor Cherry. Um, I have to say, I feel like a bit of a thrall given the illustrious lineup of presenters that have been before me. And after Rob's somewhat iconoclastic questioning of conventional wisdom, I wonder just how much I actually know about durability of concrete. But anyway, <laughs> I'd like to take this opportunity, as Brian said, to just talk a little bit about New Zealand experience with service-like prediction. Um, particularly with regard to practitioners trying to use these models to either design new structures or better understand the residual life and maintenance interventions of existing structures. And a couple of apologies, as the photo suggests, this is going to be completely biased towards uh, marine durability, and that's just the reality that chloride uh, corrosion is the primary uh, uh, mechanism that most affects the durability of concrete structures in New Zealand. And also, this is necessarily very subjective, and I don't claim that it's, because it's based on my personal experience, I don't claim that it's complete. So, the structure of the talk is basically in three broad themes, just based on chronological developments. So I want to start by giving you some early history about why surface life predictions came to be adopted in New Zealand and just describe a couple of them that are probably the most familiar with to New Zealand engineers. Even though they're now quite obsolete, I think they're illustrative because they do demonstrate some of the difficulties of using these things practically. Go on to that to describe a little bit of local research that was done to validate the assumptions behind these models. Um, New Zealand is not a hotbed of concrete durability research, but we have done a little bit. And finally, just talk about some practical experience applying these models and attempting to understand how existing structures are going to behave in practice. So, yeah, the first theme comes the initial recognition of the utility of these models. And it, it came about because in 1992, New Zealand introduced the world's first performance-based building code. And what this did was it didn't tell you how to build a structure, a building, a wharf. It just told you the attributes that, that structure needed to have. So there were various functional clauses saying things like, your structure must resist the appropriate gravity, seismic and uh, wind loads, for example, or your structure must protect its occupants in terms of fire. And underlying all those clauses was a, an overarching <coughs> durability clause which said that the building materials you choose to use, however you choose to use them, must be adequately durable to support all those functional requirements. And that there were two ways that you could demonstrate compliance with that building code. One was basically just to follow the existing codes and practices. So despite the nominal performance nature of the code, they were standard acceptable solutions that said, build this way and you will be fine. And the concrete structure standard, which I think is more equivalent of AS5100, um, was one of those. Or alternatively, if you wanted to build outside of the code, you could demonstrate that you're going to achieve adequate durability performance by a combination of in-service history, laboratory testing, analogy, or uh, modeling. And neither one of those options was particularly satisfactory at the time, so we're talking 1992. Um, problem with the acceptable solution was because the durability provisions of the code of the time weren't particularly great, even based on existing understanding. And the problem with the verification method was there was reasonably, really no more guidance than I've suggested. Um, and there was probably only a very little uh, small pool of technical expertise in the country who could knowledgeably apply these models in any case. 
Um, and there, there's just an example. This was the uh, concrete structures standard at the time. So it basically said that for building and marine areas, you just chose a combination of concrete strength and concrete cover. And obviously, strength is a loose proxy for the permeability of the concrete. So as you go up in strength, you reduce permeability and you need less cover to protect the reinforcing. And the shortcomings with that, it was written specifically around a 50-year design life. And at the time, infrastructure owners were looking for longer design lives, 100 years, 150 years even. And it only recognised type GP cement, so <coughs> standard Portland cement binders. And there was no allowance for use of blended cements. And as you've heard previously, they are important for reducing the permeability of the concrete. And consequently, the concrete producers saw a considerable commercial opportunity to sell better durability solutions to their customers. Very broadly at the time, there were two players in the New Zealand concrete industry, Allied and Firth. And if you went and asked for a marine concrete from each of them, one would want to sell you a mix based on a granulated blast furnace slag based binder, and the other would suggest that you used silica fume. And I think at the time the silica fume was brought in from Australia. And yeah, there was no <laughs> native source for either these SCMs in New Zealand or indeed fly ashes, just because we don't have much of an industrial base that produces them. So consequently, these durable concrete solutions, they were sold at, at a premium. You weren't using up a waste material in your concrete, you were you were paying top dollars for that. So there was really an imperative on the concrete companies to adopt some kind of model that demonstrated why you should pay this premium. And you, you probably don't need to see this diagram for the fifth time today, I think. But a, accepted wisdom is that chlorides are an aggressive agent that will cause corrosion of reinforcement and they will penetrate through the cover concrete over time and that there is some minimum threshold level and we'll talk more about what that threshold level might be later, which initiates corrosion. So there's two things you can model, as you've already heard. You can model the initiation time, how long it'll take for the chloride concentration at the reinforcement to exceed that threshold, or you can go on and model the propagation time, how long it takes before some level of damage is sustained that reduces the structural capacity of uh, your structure. Now, most of the models, in fact, all of the models were based on fixed law, which, fixed second law of diffusion, which just says that at any point in your concrete, the flux of chloride ions arriving is proportional to the rate of change of the concentration gradient that's already been established. Um, that explanation probably proves that I'm not a mathematician. I'll prove I'm not a physicist by saying that my intuition of that is it, it just says that marbles roll faster than the steepest part of the hill. But the, the main value of that is that you can pr obtain a simple, oops, just, a simple analytical solution to that partial differential equation, which is Crank's solution there. And it's useful because it allows you to predict uh, the chloride concentration at any depth in your concrete at any time on the basis of two parameters that are very familiar to engineers, so a force and a resistance. The, surface chloride concentration that's accumulated on the face of your concrete and the diffusion coefficient, which is a measure of its quality. And the advantage of that equation, it's simple, it's easily manipulated, you can do it with a spreadsheet, and as I think Jack said, you go out and look at chloride profiles in concrete structures, and that describes it reasonably well. Um, disadvantages are that uh, the diffusion coefficient and the surface chloride may not be invariant, they may change with time, and typically, people use this in two different ways. They use it to, for laboratory experiments in the laboratory where they've taken great care to try and measure a true diffusion coefficient on saturated concrete, so where ingress is only a result of uh, chemical gradients in fully saturated pores. But they also go out and just use it to characterize chloride profiles in structures where you've got multiple uh, transport mechanisms as wo at work, as you've already heard, so possibly capillary absorption, wicking, permeation, as well as true diffusion through partially saturated concrete pores. So the Allied model, which was the, one of the concrete industry players, is based on work produced by U uh, Phil Banforth in the UK of Taywood Engineering. 
And the, the crux of it was a claim that if you look at historical structures, um, it, you see a reduction in the apparent diffusion coefficient over time. So uh, your concrete progressively becomes more resistant to penetration of chloride ions, and that reduction is very large for concretes containing slag binders and virtually zero for uh, just binders with plain Portland cement. By contrast, the Firth model was somewhat different. It was less empirical. It was more of an attempt to take account of the realities of the situation. So, for example, it said that the initial uptake of chloride ions in most structures is going to be by capillary absorption. And that's going to be quick and is effectively going to reduce some of your cover. It considered diffusion coefficients measured on laboratory specimens. And even though silica fume concretes have very low 56-day diffusion coefficients, because they're measured on fully saturated concrete, they're still significantly higher than what you would typically observe in the field. It said that you need to take advantage of the fact that silica fume concretes have very high resistivities, and consequently your propagation period was important. And so if you just look at those two models, you can see how potentially confusing that would be to a would-be specifier trying to look at solutions produced with each of them. One was based on historical performance. The other is based on laboratory testing. One says your diffusion coefficient reduces with time. The other ignores that. One allows for the propagation period. One doesn't. And yeah, you had to feel a little sorry for the designers and specifists trying to use these adoption at the time. I mean, I think the reality is lots of them were just relieved to see that a model existed and they could point to the people responsible for their budgets and say, look, there's a reason I'm spending $450 a cubic metre on this concrete rather than $150, and that's science. And this is how I demonstrate it. But there's probably a question about whether they were truly competent to assess the merits of the models and the input data the concrete companies were giving them. So by the end of the 1990s, the models were routinely being used, and that was good because it was driving people to specify blended cement concretes rather than the Portland cement concretes allowed by the standard. And I think history has proven that the structures at that time that used SCM concretes are performing well, whereas the structures in more aggressive environments with Portland cement concrete are beginning to fail now, 20, 25 years later. But there are a whole lot of other black marks as well. Similar terminology was being used for different concepts. So what was a diffusion coefficient? Was it something measured in the lab? Was it something measured on structure? Was it in measured on saturated concrete? Was it measured on partially saturated concrete? There was no agreement on the best practice for using these models. Uh, marketing considerations were driving their adoption rather than science. Um, that's not intended to be a hit against the authors of the models, but there is always that underlying doubt and that there was no technology transfer from research organisations that ought to be trying to provide a critical overview. So that prompted uh, uh, brands to get into an active local research program, essentially intended just to verify some of these claims. And if you use a fixed law model, as I said, largely they are empirical tools. They describe the shape of a chloride profile. They don't necessarily describe the mechanisms of work. And the shapes of those profiles are influenced by a whole lot, variety of different variables, including the binder, the water cement content, the exposure environment. So if you're going to use inputs to those models, you really need a large database of results that validate it. And the generally available information was deficient. We have short-term laboratory tests, um, yeah, typically just 35 days and um, giving unacceptably un conservative results for diffusion coefficients, in, typically. Or we have uh, profiles measured on structures that are many years old, and it's very hard to frequently relate those one-off measurements to characterization of the concrete that was originally used without spending a lot of time and effort on. So consequently, in 1998, a long-term exposure site program was instigated to investigate some of these uncertainties. Um, so that's just a, a list of some of the concrete mixes that were included. So initially there were four types of concrete, uh, standard Portland cement as required by the code, uh, 
glass furnace slag cement, silica fume, and a natural amorphous silica that was locally mined in New Zealand. And later, three types of fly ash were also added to the exposure site programs. They became more popular. A couple of little details, probably not of too much interest. But the main point is that the samples were produced in a ready mix concrete plant, so they were by no means laboratory concrete. They were based on binder contents appropriate to the codes at the time and they were put out onto exposure sites that were chosen to represent those uh, nominated in the New Zealand site code. And I'll just talk about the <coughs> two sites that pertain to marine concrete exposure, so what's called in our code the sea zone, which is uh, environments where the concrete may be subject to direct splashing or wave action, so typically within 100 metres of the high tide and the <coughs> coastal perimeter zone, it's sort of 100 to 500 metres from the high tide zone, depending on which way the wind is blowing. Both those exposure sites are located in Wellington, um, which is on the bottom of the North Island there, indicated by the arrow. This is the sea zone exposure site. And I remember when we first set this up, I was very disappointed. I thought that what was required was a site where the blocks would be tidally inundated so you knew how much chloride loading they were uh, receiving every day. But I guess the advantage of this side is the uh, concrete is getting splashed by the waves, but it's also an environment where lots of oxygen is available. And typically, if you go out and observe reinforced corrosion deterioration on marine structures, that's what you see. It's worst above the high tide zone. Um, Rob gave an example of the crosshairs on his bridge. Um, there's possibly one explanation for why the crosshead's more deteriorated than the piles. It's just the extra oxygen availability up there. Um, I always think that site, it, it doesn't look particularly aggressive, so I, I like to include that picture as well. You can, you can, you can just about make out the blocks um, with, and by the red arrow. Um, that also gets a big laugh in New Zealand because uh, Wellington's weather is notoriously bad. But. And this is one of the problems. The program went on for five years initially, and halfway through the program, the council decided that they wanted to redevelop that area of the water front, so <laughs> the blocks had to be removed and subsequently replaced on a new purpose-made platform. And this is the B2 side, so this is for blocks where chloride exposures by wind-blown aerosol, so about 100 metres from the high tide. And the data collection, although the concrete was characterised in various ways, the main effort went into removing cores at periodic intervals and then milling the concrete surface as a function of depth and analysing that for chloride content. And as has already been talked about, you get a plot of chloride concentration versus depth and using the solution to fix second law, you can characterise that in terms of the surface chloride concentration. So the theoretical extrapolation of your chloride concentration to the Y axis and also the diffusion coefficient, which is effectively the shape of the curve. And that's just done through non-linear curve fitting, so simple mathematical procedures. And this is an example of the results obtained. So this is the diffusion coefficient plotted against time. Uh, both are in a logarithmic coordinate system to translate the data to straight lines. And you can see that although there is a lot of scatter in the data, there is a statistically significant reduction in diffusion coefficient with time for each of those concretes, and the reduction is much more prominent for the slag concrete on the left than the microsilic concrete on the right, but that their initial chloride, uh, their initial diffusion coefficients are also somewhat different. So you do need this data to plug into the fixed law models. And as a result of this work, the New Zealand code was revised, and the main changes were making it mandatory to use a supplementary cementitious material for all concrete that was going into the aggressive sea zone. So concrete that was going to get splashed or potentially splashed by direct wave action or was it physically in brackish water. Um, and also a table was included for a 100-year design life, which is shown there, and guidance was provided in the standards as to appropriate inputs to fixed law models if you wanted to choose that alternative. It's interesting that the requirements for the B2 zone, so windblown aerosols, didn't change, and there's no real benefit to using the more expensive supplementary cementitious materials in that environment, and 
if anybody has any thoughts about why that might be, I'd be interested because you know you're still seeing appreciable chloride profiles developing in those environments, but for whatever reason the concretes just aren't performing as well. And so that was pretty much the way things stayed until 2012 when we managed to get a little bit more funding out of the concrete industry to go back and sample these concretes one more time. So these are two examples of the <coughs> changes in chloride profile over time you get. And if you look at the 13-year profiles, which are the ones in black and the highest ones, one thing that can't really be denied when you look at them is that the chloride concentration has not stayed constant. It's definitely increased over time in both cases there. And that's really a problem because if you go back and look at the maths for the solution to fix law, that this error function solution is only a genuine solution to fix law under certain boundary and initial conditions. And the principal boundary condition is that the surface chloride concentration stays constant over time. So if that isn't true, these models are completely invalidated. And that sent us back to the literature to look for a solution. And it does turn out that there is a generalized solution to fixed law available, which allows for both a time-dependent diffusion coefficient and a surface chloride that's uh, increasing with time. It's due to a Danish mathematician called Medjilbro. Um, I guess it, it's not well known. Uh, it was described as not well known uh, 15 years after uh, it was first produced. I don't think anything has changed. I think probably the reason is that uh, the error function complement that you need to calculate a fixed law solution using Crank's solution is a standard mathematical function. The psi function that Melbro developed is completely uh, innovative and you need to program it yourself if you want to use it. So there is a little extra computational complexity. It's not quite as complicated as it seems. It is still saying that you can characterize your uh, concrete by four parameters a reference diffusion coefficient, an exponent that tells you how the diffusion coefficient decreases with time, a reference surface chloride concentration, and an age exponent which tells you how that increases with time. And providing you have a time series on your chloride profile data, they have a simple geometric interpretation. So you can just plot them on a graph and obtain the solutions that way. So the question is, does this really matter, all this additional mathematical um, complexity? And the answer is yes, it does, because when you measure a chloride profile at any age, you're not getting an instantaneous value. You're getting a time average summary of all the influences on that to date. And if you're assuming that the chloride, prof uh, chloride concentration is constant, you underestimate the average diffusivity of the concrete by a factor of 1.5 to 2, typically. And that just shows an example of so what exaggeration there is for one of the concretes on the exposure site block, depending on when you measure the profile. So it, it can be significant, and that's a problem because a lot of the empirical fixed law models are based on that assumption that the chloride profile, the chloride concentration is constant <laughs> and doesn't change. And the third theme is trying to apply some of these models to existing structures. So in 2012, Rhys Rogers, who was a PhD student at the University of Auckland, did some work for the New Zealand Transport Agency, who uh, look after all the bridges on the New Zealand state highway network. And in particular, Rhys was interested in pre-stressed bridge beams, which by their nature are particularly vulnerable to reinforcement corrosion, just because of the nature of the reinforcement. And he mapped them in a GIS type tool, which allowed you to identify them by the severity of their exposure environment, their construction error, and their design type, and also zoom in on individual bridges and get information that would allow you to make a desktop assessment about the level of risk and likely life of the bridges. And because Reese was well trained as a scientist, he knew enough to go out and try and revalidate some of his predictions, or validate some of his predictions, so he went out and sampled 30 representative bridges measuring chloride profiles and carbonation and cover and some of the other tests you've heard about. 
And one of his conclusions when he reported back to the New Zealand Transport Agency was that urgent action was required to uh, <laughs> ensure that two of their bridges did not suffer from premature reinforcement corrosion failure. I like to imagine that there was an asset manager at NZTA who reacted like <laughs> that, but no, I, don't, I don't suppose they really did. But they did ask OPUS to uh, have a look at the data and re reconsider the potential <laughs> risk to those structures. So just to put you in the picture, the two bridges that Reese identified as being a particular risk are on the west coast of the South Island, so very exposed. This is the Nokwa River Bridge. It's a five-span U-beam structure, uh, about 25 years old. As you can see, it's an, a fairly exposed environment. It's probably about 30 metres upstream from the river mouth, but nevertheless... Oops. And this is the Fox River Bridge, a little bit older, I-beams rather than U-beams, but again, an exposed environment. Um, <coughs> probably a little bit more severe waves break directly under that bridge because they get reflected around the headlands. Sorry. So this is the, the kind of thing Reese did. It was very, very straightforward. As I said, he plotted chloride concentrations against depth. He assumed a particular chloride concentration threshold. He measured the cover to the critical reinforcement, so the pre-stressing, and calculated the length of time that remained until the chloride concentration at the pre-stressing exceeded those thresholds. So fairly routine. So when Opus looked at this work, we had three main questions. One is, is the assumed corrosion threshold reasonable? And you've already heard that there's a lot of debate about that. Was the sampling representative of the bridges as a whole? And is the model future evolution of the chloride profiles that Reese presented credible? So Reese assumed um, chloride concentrations of 0.03 and 0.05% uh, chloride by massive concrete as triggering corrosion. And they're in line with um, the literature he cited. But if you take a wider view, and this is data from the US uh, Federal Highways Authority, there is a whole range of data. Um, that's Reese's suggested maximum threshold. And as you can see, some of the data sits below that, some of it sits above that, and there is an enormous range, orders of magnitude, in uh, the values that have been cited by different researchers. I haven't followed it up, but I would suggest that the very precise values down here are probably by electrochemists putting rebar in simulated pore solutions and that the broad spread is by people who've gone out and tried to interpret uh, initiation of corrosion uh, by inspection on actual structures. And there's also the question of, because Reese was interested in uh, uh, pre-stressed bridges, whether you should assume a different corrosion threshold for pre-stressing strand to conventional reinforcement. And uh, the three values that are specific to pre-stressing strand are highlighted by the green arrows. And again, there's a big range there. Um, I did read one suggestion that the lubricants that are used to draw the wires to form the pre-stressing strand provide some corrosion inhibitive effect, but I don't think that's something you'd want to rely on in practice. And as, as the people have emphasized, there are a whole lot of influences on the actual threshold that you can postulate. These are stochastic variables, meaning that there are many, many things that influence them in a rational way, but their action all combined makes it look fairly random. And uh, Rob has highlighted carbonation and the alkali content of the concrete. Other people have talked about binders, wet, dry environments. I mean, th this is nothing new. I think that diagram is from the 1980s. It's well known. Um, that's a more recent approach than the building research establishment in the UK. And what they're saying is what other speakers have reiterated this morning, that there is no unique threshold. The best you can do is talk about probabilities. And sort of in Opus's field experience doing condition assessment studies, that is pretty much right, sort of at about 0.05% chloride uh, contamination at the reinforcement. It's unusual to see reinforcement corrosion, as that would suggest. At 0.15%, it's pretty unusual not to see reinforcement corrosion, although, as Rob highlighted, there are certainly cases where 
uh, you don't. And so, you know, maybe 0 0.15, 0 0.10 is a reasonable threshold to choose if you were just trying to look at the risk to existing structures. And I would have emphasized that there is a difference between looking at the risk to existing structures and the figure you should use for design purposes, which obviously needs to be a lot more conservative. <coughs> uh, so second question I said was representative sampling. So Reese was on a student's budget, and as you can see, he made fairly heroic efforts to sample these bridges, but he was limited to what he could reach them, ladders. I'm not sure what the obus health and safety people would say about that. But, um, fortunately, we got to spend a little bit of the NZTA's budget so we could do things a little bit more safely and more to the point we could sample the spans that were directly over the over the water uh, just to check that they weren't any more or less severely affected than the spans Reese was able to get at. Um, one ob observation I'd say is a lot I agree with Jack that you need to be well prepared before you go out to site and try and think about everything you can know about a structure before you go and physically test it. My experience is it is very, very difficult to look at a bridge in any environment and say that's the beam or that's the area that's going to be most severely affected. Predicting microenvironments, I think it's, it's a, a hard thing to do with any certainty. So you really do have to have good sampling across the whole of the structure if you want to make a valid assessment. And so we combined our sampling data with Reese's sampling data and uh, um, we got pretty good coverage over both the bridges. Uh, these are the chloride profiles, examples of the chloride profiles we got. Again, the, the level of chlorides aren't extreme, but that really comes back to the choice of what threshold you uh, choose. I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. And just to choose values for characterization, we just somewhat arbitrarily said we would use the 90% upper one-sided tolerance limits at a 90% confidence level for the measured diffusion coefficients and surface chloride concentrations. And that was just intended to re uh, reflect the fact that you are dealing with pre-stressed elements. You don't want any loss of section through corrosion. So we tried to set the limits fairly conservatively. So the third question, were Reese's assumptions about the evolution of the chloride profile accurate? And as I said, our data from the Brands experimental site indicated that surface chloride concentrations increase with time. Um, the literature, if you read it, is somewhat contradictory around this. I've seen statements that say, no, it's established within a few months or one to two years. Um, it's a very difficult thing to establish. Um, this, uh, that's some data from UGI, which suggests that it, it does increase with time and the rate of increase depends on the exposure environment. It's interesting to me that he suggests that the rate of increase is most pronounced for concrete in the tidal zone because other researchers will tell you that the concentration becomes constant very quickly if the, chlorine, if the concrete is exposed to daily tidal inundation. So it's hard to know what to believe. But I think you've got to say that conservatively you have to assume that there is some increase in the concentration with time. So answers to those questions... Reese assumed very conservative values, which may be appropriate for design, but possibly if you're talking about it, maintenance interventions, you could say you could accept a higher chloride concentration threshold. Is the sampling representative? Well, we combined additional data with his, and we characterized the performance by using upper bound statistical values. And is the modeled evolution of the chloride profiles credible? Well, I think you've got to at least look at the Medjilbro solution allowing for a time-dependent increase in the surface chloride concentration as another option, which is basically what we did. So just looking at the profiles, this is the modelled evolution of the chloride profiles with time based on a standard fixed law solution. So you'll note that the surface chloride concentration stays constant with time. If you use the Medjilbro solution on the same data, you see it does make a significant difference in the result and the uh, level of chloride contamination you're predicting of the reinforcement with time. Um, that just shows the same data presented in a different way, so increase in concentration with the exposure time. But the thing that really stands out to me if you look at this information is the fact that 
the difference between the two thresholds there, 0 0.05, 0 0.15, that's not great in terms of the order of magnitude variation you see in the literature, but even so, it makes an incredible difference in the predicted life that you get if what you're modeling is initiation time. And as a practitioner, that makes it very hard to go back to an asset owner and say you should uh, carry out a specific maintenance intervention in response to these, this information because, you know, are you being too conservative? Are you being not conservative enough? Should you be putting a cathodic protection on as soon as the 0.05 threshold is breached, even if there's no evidence of reinforcement corrosion, or should you just be monitoring the structure? Uh, is that too non-conservative? And similarly, results for the Nokwai Bridge, similar again, um, very much dependent on uh, whether you choose to adopt the rise in surface chloride concentration and what uh, reinforcement corrosion you accept. So it's, even though we've collected a lot of data, it's still quite difficult to know what to recommend for the best for these structures other than that they are potentially at risk and you need to pay attention to them and go out and monitor them regularly and do some of the things that's been suggested like uh, electrochemical potential surveys. So the findings with regard to the bridge, we expanded the available data set. We alleviated the concern that the previously unsampled spans over the estuarine channels were noticeably more subject to more severe uh, conditions than the samples that were originally sampled by Reese, and we modelled the predicted life using upper bound values for the diffusion coefficient surface chloride concentration. The results do suggest that it uh, for the worst cases, the residual life is 47 years for the Fox River Bridge and 22 years for the Nokarau River Bridge. But if you just look at the mean values, you do get lives of over 100 years. And um, I don't want to be seen to be casting aspersions on Reese's original research. You have to acknowledge that the bridges are in aggressive and exposure environments. The concrete durability requirements and the 3101 standard were considerably less than are current today, so bridges are less durable overall, and that estimated life is highly sensitive to your assumed corrosion thresholds, and that's very mud, much a matter of judgment. So what have we learned from 25 years of experience? It's sort of become my conviction. I, I used to believe that there would be a day in the future when I would wake up and somebody would publish a multi-mechanistic physiochemical model of transportation mechanisms in concrete, and that would be the complete answer. And I still believe somebody might produce the model. I believe I wouldn't be capable of understanding it, and perhaps more importantly, I don't believe it's realistic to go out and characterise existing structures in the level of detail you would need to apply those models. So I think at the moment it's probably more important that we all agree on a shared approach to these kinds of empirical fixed law things. Um, just like I said, simple issues like defining what does a diffusion coefficient mean. So when I use the term, I'm not using it cross purposes to you, and I'm looking forward to the concrete industry of Australia's forthcoming <coughs> recommended practice on that, which I, I know some of you have been involved with in this room, and I understand is coming out shortly, so I, th I think that should help. As I say, I think standard terminology should help. Uh, um, that would make comparisons of literature data much easier. I really want to stress, because I see this all the time, is that a low and a laboratory measured diffusion coefficient, so something like NT build 443, which people do all the time to characterize performance of concrete mixes for pre qualification in important projects, it's not the same as a diffusion coefficient you go out and measure in situ necessarily, unless you are talking about subject, uh, parts of the structure which are permanently immersed. And the apparent reduction in effective chloride diffusion with time, is a, it's real, and it's a key contributor to um, the performance of blended cements, but it's difficult to measure realistically and accurately in short time frames. I should probably point out that probably all the mixes on the Brands Exposure site, which are now what, 15, 16 years old, none of those are probably used exactly as in New Zealand. The source of the granulated blast furnace slag we use has changed, the source of the fly has changed, you can't get silica fume anymore, etc., etc. So you've got to treat those, uh, that data with a little bit of uncertainty. 
Um, the temporal changes in surface chloride concentrations are poorly understood, but I think I hope I've appreciated. I've demonstrated that they have appreciable impact on your predicted life, and that's especially true if you're using data derived from early age studies, and lots of the fixed law type diffusion models are based on early age studies, so just six months or up to two years. The uncertainties around the critical chloride thresholds for corrosion initiation at least to me, limit the potential usefulness of these for modeling residual life of existing structures. They, they give you a guide, certainly, but they don't have the kind of accuracy we would like as scientists and engineers. And that there's comparatively few existing structures for which chloride profile data has been recorded at multiple time intervals, which would allow you to make accurate assessments of changes on the diffusion coefficients and the surface chloride concentrations. And as Rob said, you, you have the problem that if you do these kind of archaeological investigations, I think you turn them, you are talking about one-off unique structures, and they may not be readily applicable to others. Um, so that concludes my talk. I would just like to acknowledge the fact that the exposure site uh, studies were funded from the building research levy, and that it was my former colleague, Derek Chisholm, who some of you may have met, who foresaw the need for that study in the first place. <laughs>